I've said before, those five C's are things that you'll see consistently and constantly you have to work in your marriage, whether you're married for one month or whether you're married for 45 years, as we heard, we can constantly, by God's grace, work on that. So I'm going to call Lee up now again, and he's going to do a session now on hard work, because I think part of that is we don't realize sometimes that actually marriage requires hard work. Of course, by the grace of God, but there is work. And unless we tend the garden, it will get quite unruly very quickly. And so what we have to do is, by God's grace, put in the hard work, and we've got to pay attention to certain things in our marriage so that it can flourish and grow, and we can enjoy the beautiful relationship that God has given us. So Lee, why don't you come and help us of how to work hard on our marriages? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sean. <clears throat> I have so enjoyed, Irene and I have so enjoyed uh, some of the conversations we've had. We wish we had, we could go away as a group for a week and just sit around and talk and share stories. And uh, But wow, what a, what a great group and uh, how blessed you are to be part of a church like this. One just senses the love and care and warmth and attention to detail uh, and the desire to see uh, all of you grow in your marriages and in every every other way. So well done. It's great to great to be here and to see it. A writer by the name of <clears throat> William Doherty uh, wrote a book called "Take Back Your Marriage," and he begins the book with a powerful illustration. Um, his office is located in St. Paul, Minnesota, not far from the farthest point north where the, uh, the, the source of the mighty Mississippi River. And uh, he describes the river's formidable but silent current that drives the waters south to the Gulf of Mexico. And he says this, that everything on the water that is not powered by wind, gasoline, or human muscle, heads south. And then he adds these words. I've thought that getting married is like launching a canoe into the Mississippi at St. Paul. If you don't paddle, you go south. No matter how much you love each other, no matter how full of hope and promise and good intentions, if you stay on the Mississippi without a good deal of paddling, occasional paddling is not enough, you end up in New Orleans. And that's a problem if you want to stay north. And I thought, yeah, that is so true of marriage. Uh, marriage calls for ongoing, consistent, hard work. Otherwise, the, the currents of life and the currents of our own sinfulness will, will drive us south. And so I want in this uh, session to think about the hard work involved in marriage. And uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the hard work of, of growing your marriage, and then the hard work of guarding your marriage, and then just a, a word or two about the, the hard work of restoring your marriage. The, the hard work of growing your marriage, first of all. And uh, just as when a person is born, the process of growth begins in their lives from infant all the way through to, to adulthood. In the same way, when God unites a couple together in the marriage covenant, the process of growing that marriage begins. Obviously, it begins before then in the courtship process when important foundations are laid. But the, God's design is that our relationship grow continually. And just to touch on, on two things that are essential for any relationship to grow in a healthy way. And one, one of course, is that we grow our marriage by embracing our our roles in, um, in marriage. 
And the, we, we, we were going to get into it in, in the second session last night, but the, uh, the delays caused by the power outages uh, pushed us. So I'm just going to touch <clears throat> briefly on it this morning. The, the roles in marriage are very clearly sp sp uh, spelled out in Ephesians, in Colossians, uh, in First Peter. They're, they're well known. But by way of a summary heading, the, the husband's role is the role of, of biblical headship. And the wife's role, in coming back to what we saw in Genesis 1 and 2 about the creation of Eve and the role that they were to play together, the wife's role could be described as, as biblical helpmate. So you've got biblical headship and biblical helpmate. And if a, if a marriage is to grow and flourish, the couple, both members of the couple, ideally needs to embrace those roles, not just to tolerate them, certainly not to ignore them, but actually embrace them as God's gift, because that's, that's what they are. When you think of God designing marriage, it's always good to look to the designer as to how we are to... Uh, sort of like the, the, the maker's manual. I made this, now this is how it's going to work. Follow these instructions and um, it's more likely to work. So those roles need to be embraced. In, <clears throat> in quick summary, uh, biblical headship involves three responsibilities. And uh, coming out of, of Ephesians 5, it involves sacrificial love. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I could preach a whole sermon or series of sermons just on that. Sacrificial love. And uh, essentially, to love sacrificially involves growing to understand your wife's needs and then seeking to meet her needs, even at cost to yourself. And growing to understand the needs of, of any other person, and particularly your wife, is, a, is an ongoing process. It's not something you intuitively, as men, it's not something we intuitively get and understand. And it comes as a result of communication. It comes as a result of conflict. But as as I have grown to understand who Irene is as a person, what she needs, then I have a choice. Am I going to choose, sometimes even at cost to myself, at my own discomfort, to, to meet those needs? And sometimes it's by something I give. Something, sometimes it's something I hold back rather than uh, demanding that. I say, well, I'm just going to not do that because it's going to pose hardship to her. So that's sacrificial love. And of course, at its extreme, as husbands, we need to be prepared to die for our wives. Very few of us will be called to do that. One of the, one of the stories that, that greatly impacted my life was the, the story of that great theologian, Benjamin Warfield. If you're in, into theology, you would have read some of Benjamin Warfield's works. He was a theology professor at Princeton and uh, he married his sweetheart, Annie, and they went on their honeymoon to, to, to on a tour of Europe. And on their honeymoon, they were caught in an electric storm, and she was struck by lightning. And she was paralyzed. And he cared for her as a bedridden wife for 39 years until her death. And they lived on the campus of the university, and he would go and lecture and teach his class. He would come back and care for her. And that was, I mean, that, I, when, I, when I heard that, I thought, wow, that's the ultimate example of loving your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Staggering, staggering truth. A second aspect of, for guys of biblical headship, it involves spiritual direction or spiritual nurturing. So Ephesians 5 again, 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy through the washing with water by the word. And so our, one of our responsibilities as husbands is to, is to play a nurturing, a spiritually nurturing role in the lives of our wives. Now, that's not, that's not always easy. Sometimes in a couple, you have a wife who may have known Christ for a lot longer than the husband. Uh, she may have a lot more biblical knowledge than the husband. But that doesn't mean uh, that the husband cannot play through his prayers, through his encouragement, even through his engaging his wife and, and learning from her uh, a, a, a spiritual nurturing role uh, in, in her life. And then, of course, the third area is physical care. And again, Ephesians 5 from verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And so, in the same way as, as, as men and, and as any human being, we're conscious of our own bodily needs. We take care of, we protect our bodies, we feed our bodies, we clothe our bodies, we look after our bodies. And in the same way, we have a responsibility for the provision and the protection and the care of our wives and our families in a, in, in a physical sense to meet their, their physical needs. And so, in a nutshell, guys, that's, those are our responsibilities. And it's a case of, of learning and growing in understanding. And, and sometimes it's, it, it's tough to understand your wife's needs. One of the challenges of marriage, I always say to couples in, in premarital counseling, there, there are five areas where every couple has to make adjustments and learn. So the one area is that you're male and female. That's the most obvious. And uh, we all know that. But you know the whole, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus thing, or the defending the caveman. Men and women are so different, and it can be so humorous, but it can also be flippin' difficult. Uh, <clears throat> I, rem <laughs> I remember hearing a, a, a story. It's a, a sp we lived for three years on Vancouver Island, and pastored the church in downtown Victoria on Vancouver Island. And... Uh, to get from the island to the mainland in Vancouver, you have to take a ferry. So if you live in Victoria, you have to drive up to Swartz Bay where the ferry terminal is, and that'll take you about half an hour. And then you wait in a queue in your car in the parking lot until the ferry comes in from Vancouver. And then you take your turn and you drive up onto one of the ferry decks. And then when all the cars are loaded on the ferry, then it, shut, then it, it closes up an hour and a half across the straits to... Uh, um, to uh, the, the Vancouver Ferry Terminal, and then you've got to wait patiently while all the cars get out, and if you happen to be at the back, you wait and wait and wait. So all in all, uh, what would take you 20 minutes by car takes you about three hours because of the ferry. And so as there, was, there, were, there was this pastor in, 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 in Victoria, and one morning in his quiet time, the, the, the Lord said to him, you know, I made the whole world. I can do anything. You know, just ask me anything that you like, and I'll do it for you. And he thought a bit, and then he said, Lord, I would really, really like it if you could build a bridge from Victoria to Vancouver. It would save me so much hassle and so much time. And there was silence in heaven. And then the, the Lord came back and said, you know, that's a very, very difficult thing you're asking. I mean, there's a, a stretch of water. It's deep. The currents are strong. Uh, maybe, maybe ask me for something else. <laughs> and so he thinks for a bit, and then he says to the Lord, Lord, could you please help me understand my wife? <laughs> and again, there's silence. And then the Lord says, about that bridge. <laughs> but as, but as, cha as challenging as it is, um, you can't, as men, we can't really love our wives unless we understand them. 
and understanding takes the Lord's help, it takes patience, it takes time, it takes communication, it takes repentance when you blow it, and then the constant choices to love in a way that even is costly to me. And then the wife's role, according to Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5, and it is so important that you couple Genesis 1 and 2 with Ephesians 5. If you don't do that, you end up with a misinterpretation of this, with this dreaded S word, this, this submission word. But if you understand Ephesians 5 in the light of Genesis 1 and 2, you realize that in Genesis 1 it says, God made man in his own image, male and female, he created them, and he said to them, rule over the earth, subdue it. He said to them, that was their, their task. And then in the same way, in Genesis chapter 2, as we saw last night, God, God creates Adam, and he puts him in the garden, and he says, work this garden, cultivate this garden. I've got work for you to do. But then God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. He can't do this by himself. He needs someone to compliment him, to help him, someone with different skills so that together, and in that context... There's this responsibility. He says, I will make a helper suitable for him. In Ephesians, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. And it's the, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the orderly functioning of society, in all of those passages where the order of society for the, for the flourishing of society there has to be that order. And so you find it in Ephesians, you find it in Colossians, you find it in First Peter, you find it in Hebrews chapter 13. In the marriage relationship, it's wives submit to husbands, children submit to parents, employees submit to employers, citizens submit to the, the God-appointed rulers of the state, in the church, members Submit to leaders. That's for the healthy functioning and flourishing of society. And that's the context in which the, uh, the submission command has to be seen. And uh, that, when, when Scripture says that, you know, wives submit to your husband, it doesn't mean that you become mindless, some sort of a marshmallow that has no opinion, that has no pushback, that has no discussion, where there's no place for disagreement. But at the end of the day, for the marriage to flourish, there has to be clear leadership and headship. And so when we talk about growing the marriage, you start by embracing your roles in marriage. Because if you fight those roles and don't embrace those roles and and enjoy those roles, then you'll be in trouble. So you guard your marriage by embracing those roles and then um, by fulfilling those, those responsibilities. That's the key to growing, growing your marriage. Now, I want to talk a bit about guarding, uh, uh, about the hard work of guarding your marriage. So you, you grow your marriage by embracing your roles and fulfilling your responsibilities, and you guard your marriage. Um, I, Irene is a wonderful record keeper. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a terrible administrator. I'm a terrible record keeper. I can never find anything. Stuff just gets lost, like my computer records are a disaster. My, if I have a piece of paper... If it's not stuck to the wall, I won't remember where it is, where she, she just is meticulous. She can find anything. She organizes everything. And so she keeps records. And we said last night, over the course of ministry, I've married about 380 couples. And we have scrapbooks with pictures of just about every couple that I've married. And we try to keep track of them, keep track of their children. Obviously, we've lost track of some, but there are many that we're still in touch with all these, all these years later. 
And she reminds me, it's so-and-so's 25th anniversary coming up. And so I pick up the phone, and I phone them in New Zealand. Hey, this is Lee. Remember me? Happy 25th anniversary. Well done. How's it going? And they say, you are wonderful. You're fantastic. What an incredible pastor. And I say, yes, I am. But <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we also, we also, therefore, keep track of marriages that, that, that sadly don't make it. And uh, it's always an, an agony to us, and I'm going through it now with a, a, a couple of c couples that I've married in the last 10 years who are going through very difficult marriage situations, and uh, it looks like both could end in divorce. And I, I ache with those couples. I, I, I've, I've journeyed with, with, with many couples where the marriage hasn't worked Sometimes it's been a, a mutual realization this is not going to work, and sometimes for good reasons and bad they've got divorced. Sometimes the one has really wanted it to work, but you've got to make you, you've got to have two to tango, and so it, it it simply doesn't work. But sometimes where there have been a breakdown in marriage is because the marriage hasn't been guarded, and I can get into the stuff of the marriage with the couple and realize wow, this, this actually didn't need to have happened if you'd been more careful in, in, in guarding your marriage. And so I want to just share a couple of things about the important work of guarding your marriage because no couple gets married with the idea of, are we going to get divorced? You plan to make it go the distance, but in life stuff happens and sin happens and circumstances happen. But we can, as much as is humanly possible, with the help of God, guard our marriages. And uh, we need to guard our marriages, first of all, against destructive behavior. In, Coloss um, in, in, in Colossians uh, chapter 3, Paul says this word to husbands. Husbands, love your wives... And do not be harsh with them. I've often thought, yeah. The Holy Spirit could have guided the apostle to say so many things to us husbands. We've got so many flaws and we can sin against our wives in so many different ways. But why does he pick this thing? Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Because God knows that as husbands, this is one of our besetting sins, the sin of, of being harsh with our wives. And uh, it's a sin to which we as men are particularly prone. And harshness is destructive to marriage. And harshness can take many forms. And uh, in Matt Chandler's a series called The Beautiful Design, he highlights the fact that the sins, the, he highlights a couple of sins to which we as men are particularly prone. And they can be, they're particular manifestations of harshness. And the one is what he calls selfish passivity. Now we don't think of that as harshness and hurtful, but it actually is. Selfish passivity. In other words, it's abdicating our responsibility to love unselfishly, to lead spiritually, and to care sensitively. Those are our responsibilities, remember? And we can do that. We can escape into work, into sport, into television, and we can just be passive and leave the load of building a marriage, and running a family up to our wives. And that is a, that, that's something that as men we have to really guard against. And we can justify it by saying, oh, you know, I work hard all day and I'm tired when I come home and you know, I'm the one who puts bread on the table. And all of that is true or may be true. But we still have that respons those responsibilities. And if we're passive, if we abdicate our biblical headship role, that actually is hurtful 
to our wife and to, and to the relationship. And then the, maybe the flip side of that or a related area is what Matt Chandler calls selfish aggression. So you've got selfish passivity, which is just kind of abdicating, but then you've got selfish aggression, and some husbands are prone to selfish aggression, and it has many manifestations. And as you are around couples in social occasions, on camping trips, or when you see couples and you're engaging with them together and you're around them a while and they begin to let their hair down and you begin to see things like a husband mocking, belittling, demeaning, slandering, retaliating, sarcasm, unkindness, nitpicking, shouting, swearing, hitting, pushing, lecturing, manipulating, threatening, abandoning. That is hurtful and damaging behavior. And I think all of us as husbands can look at that list and say, uh-uh, the times when I've been guilty of that. And that is damaging to the soul of a wife. It crushes the wife's sense of worth and of value. And so we have to guard against that form of harshness. Husband, love your wives. And don't be sinfully passive. Don't be selfishly aggressive. Because that is going to undermine and white ant your marriage. And then what of the wife? What destructive behavior must she guard against? Uh, we discover in Genesis 3.16 that as a consequence of the fall, Eve would have a sinful desire to oppose Adam and to assert leadership over him, reversing God's plan and order in, in the marriage. And uh, in this power struggle, what is a woman's chief weapon? It's words. Words. Matt Chandler says, women can either with their words inject a type of fertilizer into human flourishing that makes everything grow, or they can, like some cruel ninja assassin, burn it to the ground. Solomon said the same thing in Proverbs. The tongue has the power of life and death. And that applies both ways. We've all got tongues. And the tongue has the power of life and death. Solomon in Proverbs 19, 13. A foolish son is his father's ruin. And a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping. And living with a, a quarrelsome wife is sort of like, you know, that waterboard torture. Also in Proverbs, better to live on a corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. It's as if God says, it's better to live on your roof than in your house with a woman who's constantly going to jab you and poke you and emasculate you and question you and is an expert in wounding you with her words. And then again in Proverbs 21, 19, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. And it's as if God says, man, get your stuff and get out into the desert. You're probably going to die, <laughs> but it's better than where you are. <laughs> Now again, I'm not beginning to suggest that as husbands and wives you have to be marshmallows and just get run over. There's a, there's a healthy constructive criticism, as Irene and I mentioned earlier. There, there's a healthy confrontation, but there's a way to do it that is life-giving and a way to do it that is soul-destroying. And I've done it in ways that are soul-destroying, and I'm learning and have been learning over the years to do it in more in ways that are life-giving. I still don't get it completely right. 
But you, guarding your marriage is so, so critical. Guarding against destructive behavior and destructive words. And the key to that, as we said at the end of our, of our testimony session earlier, the key to that is our relationship with Christ. I picked up the other day uh, J.C. Ryle's great book on holiness. And just in the, in the opening pages, he says, Union with Christ. Union with Christ is the root of holiness. I can't live like this by myself. But I have, by virtue of being in Christ, the resources that I need to love Irene as Christ loved the church. Without him, I'm so sinful, I cannot do that. And so it all comes back to our, number one, our, our, our relationship, our union with Christ, and then the cultivation of our daily relationship with him through the word, through prayer, and, and so on. So we need to do the hard work of, of growing our marriage and guarding our marriage, guarding a marriage against sinful behavior. And then I want to say a word about guarding your marriage against straying affection. We've got to guard our marriage against sinful behavior. Sinful behavior to which husbands are prone and to which wives are prone. And then now guard your marriage against straying affection. As Irene mentioned, before marrying her, I was married to, to Esther, who died in that motor accident on the N3. And one of, the, one of the important lessons that I've learned by being married to, to two women is that if I think of my personality, Lee Robinson, as a, as a piano keyboard, I came to realize that there are keys on the keyboard of my personality that Esther played that Irene never touches. And in the same way, there are keys that Irene plays that Esther never touched because they're two different people. And I think it's true to say that in no marriage do the partners play all the keys on each other's keyboards. It's simply that kind of marriage does not exist. And so what, where the danger lies is that if our marriages are not healthy, and even if they are healthy, in the course of life, in church, in work, in your social circle, at the gym, wherever, in the course of life, you will come across a member of the opposite sex who, as you engage with him or her, you will realize that I like being with this person. In terms of my keyboard illustration, they play keys on my keyboard that my partner doesn't play. And that's, that's reality. Guys, there are women out there can, that can play keys on your keyboard that your wife doesn't play. And women, there are men out there who will play keys on your keyboard that your husband will never play. That's life. That's the way God's planned it because he's made everybody different. But... Where the danger comes is if we are not cultivating our marriage and if we are not careful in guarding, we can, you know, it starts out as a little chat over coffee at work and then it leads to, uh, an, you know, other discussions and then it's a lunch together and then it's hanging around afterwards to work on a project and then it's, you know, and then if affairs don't start by a couple getting into a lift and saying, oh, I'd like to have sex with you. That's not the way affairs start. Affairs end in bed, but they don't start there. They start with a relationship that may start out perfectly fine and innocent, but gradually you say, oh, I like those keys. She plays keys on my keyboard that my wife doesn't play. Let me spend a bit more time with her, and gradually, gradually, gradually. And I have sat over the years in ministry 
with dozens of couples where either the wife or the husband has got involved in an extramarital affair. And when you dig around, invariably, this is what's, this is what's gone on. And uh, it is critical that you are honest with yourself because often we lie to ourselves and we say, oh, no, it's nothing. It's, it's, no, it's nothing. And your wife or husband may pick it up and say, well, I, I, I just sense you have a chemistry with so-and-so and I'm not comfortable with that. Oh, you've been ridiculous. But we've got to be so, so careful. I, I could keep you here all day with, with, with stories where I've seen this happen. And it is, it, it is so subtle. You have, to be, you have to be so disciplined and so careful and so honest. And the, in, uh, in Malachi, the, the, last, the last book of the Old Testament, there's a, a very interesting and, and very, very important passage where the prophet is addressing the people of God, and God was unhappy with them because of a number of different ways in which they were uh, behaving sinfully. And, and, uh, and the prophet says this in Malachi 2.13, Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with your tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, Why? And then he says, it is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner, there's that word again, your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. See, that language is there in the Old Testament. She's your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Verse 15, has not the Lord made them one? There we go. We've been there before. Has not the Lord made them one? In flesh and spirit they are his. So guard yourself, here it is, guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. Guard yourself in your spirit. Malachi says it again. He repeats it twice in that, in that passage. Guard yourself in your spirit. Sort of like, like uh, Solomon's warning in Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, he says, above all else, guard your heart because it, is, because it is the wellspring of life. Your heart is the fountain of life. Guard your heart. I mean, we live in a nation of guarders, don't we? I mean, we, spend, we all spend money on guarding, guarding our houses, guarding our stuff, guarding our cars, you know, insurance and alarms and razor wire and electric fences and, you know, security. I mean, we, we are a nation of guarders and we spend money on guarding. And we should. That's, that's life. But God's word says, above everything else, this is the Jerusalem Bible translation, above everything else that is to be guarded, guard your heart. Because affairs start in the heart when we're unguarded. And that can lead to so much difficulty and destruction. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember the covenant you've made with your partner. Remember that God is all-seeing and all-knowing. And even though you may lie to yourself and think, ach, it's nothing, uh, you can't hide that from him. Let me conclude with just a, a, an important word about the hard work of restoring your marriage. Restoring a marriage is hard work. Whether the marriage has been damaged by wrong behavior or by a, another relationship, r restoring a marriage is hard work, but it's, it's gloriously possible. I, probably one of the, one of the most joyful moments of my life as a pastor happened at Honey Ridge Baptist Church where I was, we pastored there for, for 17 years. And uh, one Sunday, 
in a communion service, I wasn't leading the service. I was sitting off to the side, and one of the elders was leading the service. And he talked about the, he was reading from Isaiah chapter 53, about the Lord taking our sin and providing forgiveness and providing healing. By his wounds, we have been healed. And, uh, and, and just the, the, the power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse from sin. And it was part of the preparation for us coming to the Lord's table and partaking of the bread and the wine. And I was sitting there on this, sort of on the side. The church was sort of shaped like this. And uh, from where I was sitting, I could see five couples. And I knew because I had walked the road with them, I knew that in the case of each of those couples, either the husband or the wife, had an, had an extramarital affair. And I had walked with them through tears, through rage, through hopelessness, through anger, and, and, and I had seen God in his grace Restore those five couples. Not every couple was restored. Those just happened to be those five there on that day. And I looked. Nobody else knew. Nobody else would ever know. A team of horses wouldn't drag that information out of me. But I knew what God had done. And as I saw them and I looked at the communion table, I realized, yeah, Lord, it does work. There is forgiveness for the biggest failure, for the biggest mess, we have a Savior who died and rose again so that sins could be forgiven and so that sinners could be given a fresh start. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. The hard work of restoring a marriage. There's an interesting little recipe, interestingly, in in Revelation chapter 2, where in Revelation 2 and 3, you'll remember, are the letters of the risen Lord to the seven churches in Revelation, seven churches in Asia Minor. And the first one is a letter to the church in Ephesus. And he praises the church for a number of things, as he does in most of the letters. And then he says this, Nevertheless, I have something against you. You have left your first love. He's addressing a church. He's addressing a congregation of believers. Nevertheless, I have something against you. You have, re you have left your first love. And applying that to marriage, that's what can happen in a marriage. And maybe that's where your marriage is today. You've left your first love. And then Jesus goes on and he says to this church, and it applies equally to marriage, he says three things. First of all, he says, remember. Remember the height from which you've fallen. In other words, he says, remember how it was at the beginning. Remember the love that you had for each other once. Remember the good that you saw in each other once. Remember your first love. And then he says, goes on to this, and he says to this church, repent. Repent. In other words, turn around, say sorry. Repent. And then he says this, and do the things you did at first. So remember, repent, and repeat. Start doing the things you did at first. He doesn't say, feel the feelings you felt at first. Because you can't switch on those, you know, those lack of feelings that you had in your courtship days. Ay, ay, ay. It was so... Whew, I'd like to feel that again. Uh, you can't switch on those feelings. But you can start doing the things you did at first. Those actions of love, those words of encouragement, those thank yous, those words of appreciation. And as you do the things you did at first, the feelings can be 
rekindled and gradually do that come over time. I remember just two couples who both happened to be leaders in one of the churches that I was privileged to pastor. And uh, the one couple, there were keys on his keyboard that his wife didn't play. He was a sportsman. He loved sport. He loved the gym. He was one of those guys who was, you know, a cyclist and a gymmer and you name it, he was into it. You know, but his wife was not into sport at all. You know, she didn't, that didn't, that wasn't her, that didn't float her boat. And uh, he met up with a lady at the gym and they started, you know, gymming together and chatting together and, you know, exchanging, you know, what drink can make you stronger and all the stuff that gymmers talk about. And, uh, and one thing led to another, and it ended up in an inappropriate relationship. And uh, I don't think, it, I don't believe it led to actual uh, sex, but it was, it, it was an affair, certainly, in, in every way short of that. And God graciously touched his heart, and that was exposed, and Somebody saw them together somewhere on the East Rand, far away. And uh, he told me about it. I saw so-and-so you know, walking hand in hand with this lady in a park on the East Rand. And what do you, what? so I just got a hold of him and I said, hey, what's going on? And he said, oh, yeah, that did happen. And, and I, I was unwise and I, and I repented and I got things right with my wife and I broke that off. And, uh, and, and the Lord wonderfully, wonderfully restored that marriage. And, and, and that God, God is in the business of restoring, of restoring broken things. And so I want to, I want to encourage you, if, if your marriage needs restoring, sometimes you need outside help to do it. So I love that letter that was on the, uh, on the tables last night where the, the, the pastors and elders of, of, of this church said, look, if we can help you, here's the phone number, get in touch with us. And uh, I've had the privilege over the years of helping of helping couples and sharing some of the lessons that Irene and I have learned. And so uh, go to your pastors, seek help, because it's really worth it to restore it. And uh, the provision that God has made for our healing and restoration is just absolutely wonderful through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God bless you. Sean, I'm, I'm done and I'm over to you. while you're here, Lee, um, just had a sentiment when you mentioned on that last point around the cross of Jesus Christ and mm. the grace of God and His ability to redeem. I think there's a moment maybe just for us as a couple, as couples, just to respond to that now. So maybe if you're there and it's struck something in your heart and there's a conviction, if you don't mind, man, I'd love for Lee to pray for us into that area specifically. And uh, if we could just trust for the Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts. So maybe if you're there, your partner, you want to grab them by their hands. And uh, let's trust the Lord that he would help us to guard our marriages. And for many of us that maybe are on the brink, um, this is the Lord's grace to us again. That he reveals it to us. I think just even being here on a weekend like this is a demonstration of God's grace. And his grace is far bigger than our sin, than our shortcomings, than our weakness, and the power of Jesus Christ to redeem us is wonderful. So I'd love for you to just pray into that, and then maybe we'll do a short break before we do Q&A. Now let's pray together. <laughs> oh Lord, we, we thank you so much for your grace and your wisdom in designing marriage. Thank you that it was your idea in the first place that you performed that first marriage in the Garden of Eden and you have united together in marriage every couple who's made that marriage covenant down the years in every context and culture imaginable 
even contexts and cultures where you're not known and acknowledged. Thank you for this glorious creation ordinance of marriage. And thank you, Lord, that you long that our marriages would be strong and secure and satisfying, that they would flourish. But we acknowledge, Lord, our weakness and our sinfulness. We acknowledge that so often we don't obey your word. We ignore the promptings of your Holy Spirit. And we do and say things that are destructive, that are hurtful, that are painful. But we thank you that there is forgiveness with you. And thank you that there is a way back for a marriage that has become dull and difficult and painful. And Lord, I, I pray for each of these couples here, including me and Irene, that you would that you would continue to work in our hearts and help us. I pray, Lord, for any couple here today who may be in a particularly difficult space. Maybe things have just been slowly deteriorating through wrong behavior, through perhaps another relationship, another love that has been allowed to intrude. And Lord, I pray that right now, this in this moment, that through the work of your Holy Spirit, you would grant a deep inward resolution to remember, to repent, and to begin to do the things that were done at first. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them courage to reach out for help. And I pray for wisdom and grace for those who will be in the position to counsel and to guide. We need your help in that, in this sacred task of helping to restore marriages. So I pray, Lord, for your blessing on us and your help as we move forward to build solid and satisfying and, above all, God-glorifying marriages. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Such a wonderful session. Guys, we're going to take a five-minute just a break, and then we're going to come back and do some Q&A, and we're going to we'll do that just to honor your time. This